Welcome back to another episode of the Frustrated CEO Podcast. My name is Patrick Lyons. I am one of your co-hosts. I'm here today with only one of my other co-hosts, Lab Tannenbaum. How are you, my friend? I am good. Happy to be here. Good. What did you do with Patsy? Where is she today? <laughs> you have to ask Patsy. <laughs> uh, listener, our, uh, obviously, the, uh, the brains of this operation happen to be on vacation today. So uh, actually this week, good for her. Uh, so we are venturing forth without one third of our team. It's just Leb and I today, but uh, we are certain we're still going to have another great episode because we have a great guest to bring. Tune in. Uh, we know this is something that impacts so many of you listeners out there, and that's the topic of exit. So our guest today to help us unpack that topic is Mac Lackey. Now, Mac is an uh, American entrepreneur who has started, scaled, and sold six companies, all of which were seven or eight figure exits. Mac and his companies have been featured on CNN, Wall Street Journal, Fast Company, Business North Carolina, US Today, and the New York Times. Mac has served as a member of the board of directors for Lending Tree for over five years. He's currently an angel investor in over 50 companies. And here at home, he's the founder of Exit DNA which is a guide for entrepreneurs and business owners who want to position their business for future sale. Now, full disclosure, we've been trying to get Mac on this program for over a year, but scheduling was actually an issue because Mac spends half of the year living in Spain. And in this case, it's not because of a business exit. Uh, it's actually because of a relatively new business venture. A little over a year ago, Mac purchased a professional soccer team in the south of Spain, Algeciras CF. So Mac, before you run off to Spain again for the upcoming season, welcome to the Frustrated CEO Podcast. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, apologies for uh, taking so long to get here. Yeah, it was, you know, we almost gave up. But when honestly, uh, we didn't, uh, the minute I heard you were back in the country, but also preparing to leave, I thought, okay, let's capitalize on this. Um, so as I mentioned, Mac, a primary theme in our conversation today is going to be business exits. But I would think along the way, we're also going to have to hear lessons learned about uh, starting and building those businesses to prepare them for sale. But let's maybe start with the end in mind, start with the exit. Um, what are some of the biggest mistakes that entrepreneurs make when thinking about exits? It's such an important question. Um, I would say there are a couple that come to mind very quickly. The first is honestly waiting and believing that if and when they decide to exit, they can kind of switch gears and create a great outcome, especially if they have a really successful business. It, it sort of follows logically that you built a great business. A lot of people should be interested. Therefore, you want to sell it. You want to take it public, whatever your goals and dreams are. You just kind of hit a switch and that happens. The reality is less than 20% of entrepreneurs who are actively trying to sell their company ever get to the exit door. And so the odds are somewhat stacked against you, which to me, the biggest kind of takeaway is you have to start early. You have to start being proactive and planning. And it's a lot of, you know, what I help entrepreneurs do today because I know how important it is. So that's far and away the biggest. Um, the other thing I would say that's it's kind of a tragic uh, common theme is so many entrepreneurs believe their business is valued based on a financial metric. And that's an EBITDA multiple or a revenue multiple or even some industry specific multiples. And the reality is, while that can be meaningful, the greatest exits almost always happen when you find someone who is buying your business based on its unique strategic value to them. So finding the right buyer and someone that really needs or wants what you've created, that's a very strategic exit mm. and almost has nothing or very little to do with your financial performance, believe it or not. What did you call it? You called that you, their, your unique it's basically the strategic value that you've created. You know, it tends to come in a lot of different forms. It's different for every business, but finding someone that really values those things and is willing uh, and interested to pay a premium for them. Hmm. You said 20%. 
only 20% of businesses or business owners who are hoping to sell their business are successful. Well, think about those. What makes them? How do I, how do I make sure I'm in the 20%? Yeah, I think there, there are a number of reasons why, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs fall into the 80%. Of course, it is, you know, unrealistic expectations. It is waiting too long. It's timing. It is, you know, a number of things that they just don't really have the business prepared. Um, and the other is you just haven't built something valuable. It's meaningful to you. It doesn't mean it's not a good business. It could be a good lifestyle business. It could be a business that's generated plenty of revenue or opportunity for you, but no one else is willing to pay a premium for that. And so a lot of those things happen. But in order to be in the 20 percent or what I tell entrepreneurs now, the most important metric is even lower than that, which is if you interview entrepreneurs who have exited. So in the 20 percent and ask them after the fact, did you maximize value? It's probably only a few percentage points. It is so mm -hmm. few because what they do, and I, I did this myself, my first few exits, I realized after the fact, I could have, I should have done a lot of things that would have changed the outcome. I just didn't know what I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I think being proactive, preparing, putting all the things in place early, really mitigate that risk of, of the odds that are stacked against so many entrepreneurs. Mac, how, how do you know it's the right time? It's it's a really uh, interesting question because we, we have a uh, in my exit DNA group, we have this session that I call the five factors and the five factors mm -hmm. basically encourages entrepreneurs to consider five categories, all of which I think speak to if and when someone should sell. The reality is most entrepreneurs sell for a somewhat personal reason. Most businesses are pretty closely held, a founder, an entrepreneur, maybe a quiche, you know, stakeholder, and they have financial pressure. They have kids that are going to school. They need to buy their first house. Um, there's, there's a challenge in the business. That's the primary reason. What I always say is let's open up the aperture and look at these other factors. What's going on in the macroeconomic environment? What's going on in your industry? Um, that's an often overlooked one because industries go through very logical cycles. And if you time the cycle, it can be a very meaningful reason to you know, increase the odds of an exit and, and get a better exit. If you wait too long and the industry starts you know, consolidating and shrinking, the buyer pool changes. So there's, there's really a, a number of mm -hmm. factors um, but ultimately the more of those things you can stack in your favor, when you're in the right macroeconomic situation, when your industry is in a, in a period where it's expanding, but it's not quite done. Some of those things can really lead to the best outcomes. One of the things in the few that I have been involved in, um, I think one hurdle was there was a focus on EBITDA and the owner founder often entrepreneur often thought things uh were only based on that and worth more than the market was even interested in mm -hmm. um so you know any any thoughts about especially if if they're engaging with a coach or you know a consultant or a, a, yourself in this exit uh, business that you have um where you can help them think realistically yeah, I mean, the, the, the EBITDA multiple, you know, the, the most common exit value on earth in the last five to seven years is an EBITDA multiple. It's 4.7 times EBITDA across industries, geographies, sizes. And so, of course, some industries naturally have higher multiples than others, right. but it's, it's a pretty low EBITDA multiple where most deals trade. And my advice is always, there's something in your business that's creating EBITDA. There's a reason that you have profits and that you're hopefully outperforming some of your competitors and peers. And that's where you have to really look and say, what is it that we're doing uniquely that allows us to generate EBITDA? Do we have a proprietary product or service? Do we have an amazing team? 
Have we created a powerful brand that will allow us to charge more than our competitors? And whatever those underlying things are, those are the things I call strategic value. Identify those, but then really importantly, you have to open up the aperture to the market and say, and who in the world needs those things? And that's where the magic happens is you might have a, an amazing brand, a great product, but if you can't find someone that really needs it, then it falls short. But if you find an organization or hopefully several companies that say they've created something special, it's proprietary, it's protected with intellectual property, it has a great brand, it looks sustainable, then those things you sort of stack up and say, this is why someone's going to buy our business and pay a massive premium for it. And then EBITDA becomes a very secondary discussion. It's almost like, and oh, by the way, we have a pretty nice profit. Uh, that's that's very secondary to the strategic mm -hmm. value. One of the ones that I I was involved with that was successful, I think the strategic um, value um, at least clearly was at least a part of, of the reason they got uh, a successful exit and, and sold the business was that they had focused a lot on uh, building a great culture. And it, when interviews happened and, and the real uh, digging in started to occur, they were um, they were standout. Uh, and they, it showed up in things like uh, attracting talent, retaining talent, um, having just generally um, a big edge in talent and people that didn't want to leave. No, that's it's a it's it's one of, uh, you know, a number of categories which can be really powerful. A lot of deals, of course, come down to people. And unless yeah. you have a software company that really is is not based on human capital, it's, you know, it's some unique software. The reality is your culture, your team, how engaged they are, how excited they are to continue. Those things can become a really, really big factor in driving up exit value or at least increasing the odds of a deal getting done because a buyer of yeah. course is always worried that when a deal closes a couple things are going to happen clients are going to leave and employees or you know talent is going to leave and so if you can mitigate that mm. you have this amazing culture people want to work there they're happy that goes a long way to mitigating one of the biggest risks that buyers are really looking for when they start digging into should they buy a company or not and this is sound a like a weird question because you you don't want to not have a great culture, but can that work against you when, uh, for instance, so I'm I, working with a company right now that is at that seller stage, right? And there, there are a couple of options on the table. One is to sell to an outside person and another is to sell internally. And I want to get your thoughts on selling, um, you know, change the business, changing hands with between family members in, mm -hmm. a, in a couple of minutes. But but one of the concerns that the employees have is we have a great culture and how do we protect that when the business changes hands? And, and so, <clears throat> yeah, I, I know that, that, I guess that's post exit. Uh, do you have any advice on that or, or um, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't even know necessarily what, where to go with the question, but no, it works against you. Sometimes have a great culture. People, then they feel that loss right. when the business changes hands. No, it's it's um, absolutely it's something. Um, you know, I actually had a conversation with one of our members just a couple of days ago, who's going through. Um, they're they're about to start a formal process to sell their business, and one of their biggest concerns is the business has been around for I think fourteen years, so they have a long duration, a lot of loyalty, a lot of employees that have been there. If not from day one, they've been there for you know nine, 10 years. And so people is a really important part of the business and culture is what's kept them there. And so one of the things we, we have this tool that we often talk about, which is I call it the one page deal. And the whole idea of that is if you decide to sell your business as a seller, there generally are, let's say somewhere between five and at most 10 bullet points, which are the most important things for you. And the sellers, of course, are going to have their own list. But for example, if you have this amazing culture and you want to retain that culture, that's one of your key bullet points, which will speak to who buys your company um, and what happens post deal. Because 
I've sold multiple companies where we did not sell to the highest bidder. You yeah. know, people often think, oh, it's about the, you know, who offers the most money. Yes and no. You know, there are other, that's an important one. Most every company and every founder and every entrepreneur would say, what are you paying me? That's probably number one on the list. But other things like what's the legacy? What happens to our employees? How are those employees managed? Do they have long-term agreements? Can absolutely be very high on that list to the point you would say, if we can't maintain the continuity of the culture we've built by contractually guaranteeing some things here, then we're not going to sell the business to you. We're going to find someone that does value that. So there are ways to mitigate it. At the end of the day, you can't, of course, completely control uh, what happens post deal, but you can go a long way by choosing the right buyers and making it known that those are important components of a deal and that you want some of them contractually obligated or guaranteed. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's good. great. So Mac, have people as in, in deals, have people required you to stick around for a while? It is almost every deal, certainly my own experience. Um, there has been a transition period. You know, I've, mm -hmm. I've laughed over the years. I have uh, worked for several big companies for exactly 366 days uh, because I had a one year agreement and on day 366, I happily turned in my resignation. Um, <laughs> and that is very common, you know, and, and it's it goes back to what the buyers are trying to do. The buyers are trying to mitigate risk. And so they want to make sure that there is some continuity. They want to make sure that I'm not selling them something that's about to fall apart and I need to be a key part of that transition. So in my case, um, I've almost always had some degree of transition, uh, but I also think that it's very common, at least in my experience and many of the entrepreneurs I've worked with, that it starts out with a one year employment agreement and a certain number of expectations. And then very quickly, if the transition is going well, as a matter of fact, literally this morning, I was talking to one of our clients who had an exit um, about a year and a half ago, and he said, I have two meetings a week and he's a, he's the CEO. Like they have taken his role down to such a small, um, you know, uh, component of the transition that he's wondering if he should just leave. And so um, it is very typical that they're going to want transition. Some people want it. I was trying to minimize it. I wanted to get onto my next business as quick as possible. So in my case, I was always aggressively arguing for, one year agreements, not five, but some people want the security for a period of time to say, I would love to work for a big company and have benefits and have a good comp package that I know I'm going to get paid every two weeks, uh, which is not always the case for entrepreneurs. So, mm. right, right. Mac, I mentioned earlier, um, you know, some, some sales happen internally in the family. And that's yeah. that's an area, uh, family-owned, family-led businesses is an area of, of focus for us. Mm -hmm. um, talk about the complexities. Does that make it easier? Does that make it harder when the business is sold? And I realize that's a like speaking in absolutes, um, maybe not easier or harder, but how is it different? Yeah, that's, that's how I was gonna respond. I was gonna say, I don't know that it's always easier or harder, it is, it is different. Um, right. The way I encourage, because I work with I work with a number of uh, entrepreneurs who are at least considering a transition to family or a sell the business to employees or some variation of those kind of themes, which is an internal transaction. And what I always encourage people to do is to look at it just as formally and professionally and thoroughly as if you were selling it to a total third party private equity firm, you know, maybe take the most extreme example of formality and diligence and say, I'm going to take, I'm going to treat this the same way because what's fair to a selling founder is to get reasonable value for the, the company they've created. Um, and so understanding those dynamics is often means you have to sort of step out of a little bit of the internal dynamics and say, okay, if I was selling this to a third party, what does the valuation look like? What would the terms be? What would the transition plan be? You know, some of those major points that I mentioned in terms of the one page deal, what are my five to 10 main priorities? And if we can get those down on one side of the sheet of paper and then 
the buyer, whether that's a, a family member or an employee or something more internal, has that same list, what's important to them. And if we can get alignment on those things, we can get a great deal done. Now, it's it's also interesting. My my what was technically my sixth or my last you know exit, if you will, was kind of an internal uh, exit as well because it was one of those situations where I I really love the business. Um, I was the majority shareholder. Um, I was happy. I was the business was doing extremely well, but there was a little bit of a mismatch in age. I had two very young partners who were minor, minority partners. And there was this question of, you know, how do we transition the business over time? And for me, it was either, it was kind of a, I call it an all or nothing scenario. I don't want to sell just a little bit. I either want to keep doing what we're doing, or I would like to sell my interest and allow you to grow it for the next 20 or 30 years. But in order to do that, you know, here's my number technically, right? So you kind of slide the number across the table. And the good news there was the minute we, we're aligned on there is a number Mac would sell 100% of his ownership um, and transition it to us. Then all of a sudden we agree to that on paper. Now I'm sitting on their side of the table to help them finance it because they don't have the money to buy me out, but I can help them if I'm motivated to get the deal done. So I like the fact that some of these transactions that are internal, once you get through the major points of what a deal needs to look like, you can become aligned on getting it done because it's very common for young family members or young employees, for example, to not have the financing mm -hmm. or the wherewithal to buy out the majority shareholder. But if you agree to terms, then all of a sudden you can say, okay, now I'm on your team. Let's go find a bank or a hedge fund or a capital partner to fund this buyout. And that's exactly what we did in, in my, uh, my last company. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Mac, have you been around any um, transaction sales that have been ESOP? I've worked with um, entrepreneurs that have gone through ESOPs. I, I have not myself, um, mm -hmm. you know, all of my companies, with the exception of that last one, were, you know, sold to third parties. I sold to public companies and private companies and lots of variation in my particular exits. Um, and the last one, as I said, was almost an internal transaction, although a hedge fund, you know, funded it. And so, um, but yeah, ESOPs are book, you know, they're another one of those kind of internal, you know, employee right. transactions that I think can follow the same kind of methodology. So one of the biggest regrets I've heard is later on, um, the owner saying I left money on the table. Mm -hmm. Do you have experience, experience with that? painful experience. Yeah, I, I feel very, very fortunate, you know, having had, you know, a number of exits, having six, um, most entrepreneurs in their lifetimes, if they're fortunate, will have one and, and therefore right. the stakes are extremely high to maximize value and get it right. I look back on my very first exit and it was a, it was life changing. I had an eight figure exit in my twenties. I mean, so there's no way for me to say it wasn't incredibly meaningful but i did leave millions of dollars on the table structurally I, I made some mistakes then the company that bought us went public i made more mistakes not understanding how to protect myself or my family from tax consequences of going public and just just not understanding hmm. a lot of my motivation now is is to help people avoid some of the many 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 mistakes i made um and, and even, you know, one other mistake I'll share, which I, I think is only funny because I was so convinced I had done it well. Um, I sold a business to NBC Sports a number of years ago, and there was a performance component, an earnout, and earnouts are notoriously problematic. You know, like if you talk to entrepreneurs, very few earnouts truly pay what you hope and expect. But I had really convinced myself I had done this very clever and thoughtful earnout that was going to be a home run. And it was about five days after the deal closed that they moved me from managing the team that was responsible for the earnout into a totally different part of the company. Oh, wow. which basic, they had every right to do. I just never anticipated it. And so I went from controlling the earnout to 
basically working on the M&A team and having no team. And mm -hmm. so th even in that case, I was like, okay, yeah, I'm a dummy again. I thought I had that one nailed. And so I really am, uh, I'd say hyper-focused now when I'm working with entrepreneurs, really thinking about all the structural things personally, professionally, you know, the IRS mm -hmm. here in the United States has a two year look back. And so if you want to sell a business and maximize tax benefits, start planning two years or before, because all the trusts and foundations and things you can put in place very legally, very reasonably to protect wealth um, can get clawed back if you're a year from exit, because they'll look at that as almost like a fraudulent transfer. And so you know, I learned a lot of those things by not knowing and not doing them. And then later in life, figured out how to do that stuff. So I don't think I have a question as to why people should come <laughs> and uh, participate with you in their exit. Um, yeah. Uh, Mac, well, I've, I've heard this before. I'm sure you've heard it too. Um, but you start a business to sell it. And yet um, most people start a business because they have a passion around something that they're they're doing right. They want to make a big impact on on the world, or they've got a great product or a great service, and so they go into it not necessarily thinking about their exit. They go into it thinking about, um, right, to your point, they don't think about the exit until much later. Um, <clears throat> how would I how would I start my business? And here, this is the question: like you've not only exited six businesses, you've started six businesses. How would I start a business differently? knowing I'm I'm starting it to sell it versus thinking about it later. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And I, I think there's a, a key word that I, I use almost every day of my life, if not every day of my life. And that is what you want as an entrepreneur, the day you start a business till the end of the, the, the runway is you want the option to exit. You want people to want to buy it. You want them to want to pay you maximum value for it because options are is where all the leverage is. And so what, what I think about is, you know, when I start a business, I may or may not want to sell it. I just mentioned, you know, my very last company that I, that I sold, I would have done it for 20 more years. I like the subject matter. I like the industry. I, I like the fact that we were doing very well. We grew it very you know fast and very profitably. But I, what I wanted is the ability to, um, at any point for any reason, change. You know, I, I want to sell my interest. I want to sell the whole company. And if you have that optionality, you have enormous leverage. And I can assure you every other transaction short of selling 100 percent of your company is also available to you if you have the option to exit, meaning you want to raise growth equity and take some chips off the table. You know, you've been running your company and you don't want to sell the whole thing but you have not paid yourself really well, or you have a life event, you want to buy your first house and you don't have the wealth. If you have the option to sell the business, you absolutely have the option to recapitalize it and take a few million dollars off um, while still maintaining minority or majority interest. So I'm a big believer in from day one, proactively think about how do I have the option? How do I create the option? What do I need to be doing? And a lot of the stuff that we work on within Exit DNA is just constantly, slowly creating the strategies and tactics that compound over time. It's like Einstein's eighth wonder of the world, compounding interest. Same thing in Exit Value. If you wait until you're six months out, you can still sell your company. There's no way all those little things you could have been doing will compound into enough value. But if you start years in advance, well before you're even thinking about exit, you just want the option in the future. Those little things just compound over time. Hmm. And I'm guessing that would be why someone would engage with you today versus once they've made the determination to sell. Yes. Yeah. hundred percent. As a matter of fact, I'll be, I'll be super candid. You know, one of the biggest challenges I have, I was sharing this with someone at a mastermind the other day, is I said, you know, I was speaking at an event and probably five different entrepreneurs came up to me and said, I can't wait to work with you when I'm ready to exit. And I, I put my hand up. I was like, please don't wait until you're ready to exit, you know, because I work with entrepreneurs that want the option, some of which will never sell. But because of the framework, their business is, is they're going to scale better. 
And most importantly to me, which we really didn't touch on today, one of my biggest motivations in life is I, while I was building my companies, I pulled my girls out of school and was traveling the world with them. You know, mm -hmm. I, I coached their soccer teams. I was home at five o'clock. That to me was the single best decision I made is by designing my businesses the way I did. I could always tell someone they, they don't rely on me. People don't need me in the office at all. That just means you've built a better business. But, but on a personal level, that's why entrepreneurs should want to work with me is I'm going to help them create wealth and freedom, whether they exit or not. Like that to me is I use this framework to reverse engineer a better mm -hmm. business. That's the whole way I think about it. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Well said. So soccer girls, yes, I was, girls I was, playing I was, soccer, yeah. buying yeah. a soccer team. Tell us a little bit about that yeah. part. Yeah. So, so soccer, you know, has been a, an important part of my life. Um, you know, I, I grew up playing, um, all of my goals and dreams when I was younger were, you know, to play in college and play professionally and all those things. I mean, that's, that's basically all I ever thought about and did. And I was very fortunate to kind of check off the, the, you know, soccer related things I played in college. I was an all American. I played professionally. So it was a big part of my, my life. And then when I started my first company, um, which was a tech business way back in 1995, very early internet, um, my first clients were a lot of them were soccer related, you know, we were, because that's, that was my network. And so I, I was very fortunate to kind of continuously fuse my passion for soccer with my love of business and technology. So long story short, you know, at, obviously at some point I stopped playing. I sort of shifted from player to fan. And then I shifted from, um, you know, continue to be a fan, to be a dad who had two girls that were playing and coaching them and trying to, you know, get them to love the sport I loved. But it was kind of a bucket list you know, dream. Um, we, we did move to Barcelona back in 2014 as a family. And I kind of fell in love with Spain and said, you know, I'd like to retire here and I'd like to buy a team just because I think it would be really fun. It was kind of a harebrained idea at the time. And then about three years ago, I uh, started thinking about it again and just thought, you know, why would I wait until I retire? Why not buy a club now and enjoy it when I can still travel and um so yeah we we bought a professional team 115 year old club in an amazing location in southern spain it's it's literally at the strait of gibraltar you can see the rock of gibraltar over the back of the stadium and you can see morocco 14 kilometers away africa's right there it's just this really special place on earth and uh been, been an incredible experience for me so uh, and i want to talk about leadership and the role that that plays in the value of the business, or if it plays a role in the value of the business. Um, <laughs> uh, I know you started businesses with the intent to sell, or excuse me, you started businesses um, proactively thinking about the option to sell. <laughs> right. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm getting the lingo, right? <laughs> Did you now here, you didn't start this soccer team. No, you bought this soccer team. Do you buy a soccer team? with the intent to create the option to sell? I mean, like, uh, is that, is, is it different or is there similarity there? No, there's a lot of similarity, at least, you know, at this point it's so burned into my brain that that's the best way to build a business. Right. And I, I look at this team the exact same way, which is, you know, right now there's a part of me that would say you would have to pry it out of my hands. I love it. You know, I'm having fun and I'm, I'm intellectually challenged because it's new and um, but very much like a number of my businesses, which I also loved. If someone came in today and offered me the right number, I couldn't sign the paper fast enough. I right. mean, I, because I would go buy another one, you know, like it's not like the end of the line for me. I would say, oh, this has been an amazing chapter. What's the next chapter? And so I, I definitely, you know, when we acquired the club, I have no intention to sell it. I certainly don't have any intention to sell it anytime soon, but so many of the decisions we have already made are based on value that makes our club interesting to others, you know, mm -hmm. to private equity or individuals or brands. You know, we, we move from a 
kind of a no-name apparel brand to Nike, if you know, when we bought the club because we thought hey, that'll raise our profile. And so a lot of our decisions are very intentionally mm -hmm. value creation. And whether I extract that value as the owner who gets a dividend every year or we sell the business, it, it all sort of feels the same to me, which is design it mm -hmm. to maximize value. Mm -hmm. Got it. Awesome. So I'll have to remember to uh, bill Nike as today's sponsor. Yeah. That's, uh, so thank you for that. I appreciate yeah, that. Absolutely. Uh, so what is, okay. Talk about what is the role of leadership in, or the, the you know, how does leadership, again, we're, we're talking to CEOs, frustrated CEOs mm -hmm. looking to raise the value of their business and perhaps give themselves the option, the flexibility of an exit. Um, what role does leadership play in the valuation of a business? It's it's critical. I mean, you know, a lot of the way my mind works, and this is not unique to me. This is, I think, smart business. Is I I just reverse engineer almost everything in my life. You know, I look out a number of years in the future and try to imagine what do I want it to look like, and the more powerful that that picture is. Um, the better. And then I basically reverse engineer it to today and say, okay, here's where I am today. What are the steps I need to take to get from where I am to where I want to be? And many of those steps include people, you know, great leadership. And so in my case with the club, um, I partnered with um, a gentleman who had been the CEO of a La Liga multi hundred million dollar club. So in a lot of ways, I would say he's, he's, overqualified for the team that we acquired because my vision and his vision, we have a, a shared vision, was we want to build this 115 year old club into the next level, something really special. And in order to do that, I need to have someone that's already seen that level. You know, for me, mm. as much as I'm passionate and feel like I'm knowledgeable about soccer, I've never run a professional soccer club, certainly in another country. Mm. And one of my core kind of beliefs is to get anywhere in life, you find people that have already been where you want to go, ideally more than once and learn from them. And so that's why people work with me from the exit standpoint. I've been there. I've climbed that mountain a number of times. I've found the shortcuts. I've made the mistakes. Similarly, I had to do the same thing with this club and say, hey, I, I am excited, but I'm not qualified to be the CEO. Um, mm. I need to find an amazing CEO. I need to find an amazing sports director to recruit our players and negotiate contracts. And so a lot of our vision ultimately breaks down to key people. That's what I was hoping you would say. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's um, in so many ways, it, it, you know, it is a business and, and it's probably a differentiator that I, I was excited about, which is, you know, we looked at probably 20 different clubs um, that I, in at least 10 of those, I went into due diligence with that could have been potential, you know, acquisitions for us. And with, with very few exceptions, one of the common themes with these clubs is they've really never been run like a professional business, even though they are multi-million dollar organizations. And a lot of them have been around for 50 to hundred years. They're run by people that are passionate about soccer or they're from a local area. And maybe they made some wealth in some other unrelated business, a painting company or a real estate business. And for us, it was, I have an enormous passion for soccer, but we're going to run it like a business. Mm -hmm. Track KPIs, we're going to build budgets, we're going to manage people. And that is shockingly missing in a lot of these clubs. And so we knew that if we did that even reasonably well, it would be a differentiator. And then to achieve our vision, it was always going to be on the back of the right people. Mm. That's great. Yeah. So I've only been to Spain twice, but what was were you talking about the Marbella area? Yeah, it's um, as a matter of fact, our team had a friendly in Marbella today. Um, we are probably thirty minutes south of Marbella on the coast. So oh, okay, right oh, yeah. down the coast. Yeah, beautiful. That's great. So my last question: So you watch Ted Lasso? <laughs> yeah, I always get asked about Ted Lasso and Ryan Reynolds and uh, believe it or not, I have not watched Ted Lasso um, and Ryan Reynolds. I only sort of think to myself, 
he's probably, you know, better looking, might be more famous. He's probably got a lot more money, but we're doing similar things. You know? <laughs> uh, it's, it's actually been really helpful to have the profile kind of raised because of these shows. There are a lot of people in the U.S. Yeah. That, that now are more interested in soccer as a result of what's happening on Netflix. Yeah. 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 And Portland, Oregon has become a soccer uh, base. Yeah. yeah there's been. There's a couple of cities that are just having an amazing experience with their MLS franchises, and yeah, uh, it's it's great to see. And I, and I, you know, selfishly, I thought um, in my lifetime I would never see a U.S. men's national team. I knew the women obviously have won the World Cup, but I never thought I would see the men's national team being truly competitive on a global level. And we have some work to do, but now there are Americans playing for some of the top clubs in the world legitimately. And so I, you can see the, the tide shifting, which is really, really exciting as a fan. So, yeah, it's awesome. That's great. All right. Is it, is it time to get practical? I think it is. All right. Okay. Listener, you know that this is the part of every episode where we want to leave you with something practical or not something, but some things that are practical that you can begin to do immediately to make inroads, to make progress, to right, to grow and develop. And in this case, I'm guessing most of ours are going to be about how to position your business for an exit or how to capitalize on that. Um, Mac, we'll let you go first. What are two or three, three or four things, suggestions that you would have for a that that business owner, that founder, that CEO, that they should start thinking about today? I would say, you know, first and foremost, I think we touched on this, but I would hit it with like a double highlighter. The powerful thing for an entrepreneur is to proactively and consistently create the option to exit. And whether you ever want to sell your business or not, that helps you create a better business. It helps you create a lot more personal freedom because nobody wants to buy a business where the founder is in the critical path of everything that happens. And so the more you're building value towards exit, the more you're extracting yourself as a founder, reducing dependency, and generally including uh, or increasing wealth, whether that's money you're able to take out of the business or you ultimately get in the exit. So to me, designing for the exit, whether you want to sell or not, really drives wealth and personal freedom, which is, I think, what most entrepreneurs are focused on. Awesome. Any others you'd add or you want to give us a round? I'll let you go and then I'll add to it. <laughs> All right. Lev, what do you got? Uh, I'll start with, uh, answer the question of what is the reason we're profiting and look at that from the, also the lens of strategic value. So that would be one. Um, I think I kind of jumped on, uh, look at a number of years and how do you want it to be? And then reverse engineer it, mm -hmm. um, back casting. Uh, and a lot of people, I think, in the entrepreneurial space are not doing that, just more in the start, startup energy, passion for something um, and haven't looked out. So I think that was fantastic. And um, the last, I mean, the way I captured it was, you know, find mentors and other people more experienced than yourself to help you uh, effectively grow your business. Love That's it. good. Patrick. All right. I got a couple. Um, I, um, this was, I thought this was, a, it's a, it was a good piece of guidance, Mac. There's a difference between something meaningful to you and something valuable to someone else. And, and so learn and do the work to build that perceived value to someone else. Um, that that's just ultimately going to pay off for you at the end. Um, Mac, you talked about this a few times. The, the concept of like creating your list. So what are your five to 10 main priorities, the, those things that you need or want through your exit, and then let that guide you in the process of potentially choosing a buyer and potentially outlining the terms of, of a contract. Um, I thought that was uh, insightful. And then let's see, maybe the last thing I will, <clears throat> um, well, I, 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 I love, I thought you were going to take this, but, um, uh, Mac, I just, I thought it was great that leadership plays a critical role in the valuation of a business and surround yourself with people who have already been where you want to go and who can help you get there. 
Yeah. So. Yeah. No. Th those are all. Those are all great. And and the only little quick comments I would add, just um, you know, one I think very common mistake of many entrepreneurs is we think about the kind of proverbial mountain that we're all climbing, and we think about at the top of the mountain are the goals. You know, the the freedom to spend time with family, or it's the wealth to to buy the thing, and a lot of what I feel like I have done in the past decade is help entrepreneurs see that that is the journey. Like you don't have to wait to put the flag on top of the mountain. If you want to spend time with your family, design your life around it now. Um, you know, design your business so that you have the freedom to leave at five o'clock or to travel. And if, if that is a hurdle for you, it means you're not building the right business. And, it, and it's, it's a harsh message, but mm -hmm. it's so common that I know it, it exists. You can't extract yourself, but you have to design it with people and systems. So that's a really important one that sometimes feels like cold water to people. But I just know because I'm surrounded by people in you know my age group. My daughters are you know 20 and 23. You know, one's graduated university, one's in university. The time to spend with them was 10 years ago, not now. It's too late. Yeah. And so. That's an important message. And then the last thing is just to highlight something I think you just said, which I can't stress enough, whether it's your your employees, your co-founders, your leadership team, or what I often think about, which is mentors and advisors, wherever you want to go in life, whatever you want it to look like, whether it's, again, wealth or freedom or success or impact, you have to find people that have already achieved those things and listen and learn from them. Do not try to figure it out on your own. I spent so many years thinking I just had to grind and work hard and that was the formula. And then you can achieve some success, but then I realized much later in life, I can just find someone that's already done it and they can tell me in about five minutes what I need to do. And so a lot of my time now, my own goals and dreams are who can help me get to where I wanna be faster, easier with less risk. Yeah. It's such a key like hack and strategy for every entrepreneur. Wow. It's great news. Unfortunately, Mac, the bad news is that means Lev and I are going with you to Spain. Ah, you're because welcome. Love to have we, you. we have a lot to learn. And um, <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you can teach us. So. <laughs> I'd love to have you. Anybody that wants to come over. <laughs> you, you'd get sick of us pretty quickly. Uh, all right. Listen, uh, Mac, first of all, thank you. Fantastic. Great stuff. If someone is interested in learning more about you, getting in touch with you, um, what's the best way for them to do that? So, um, yeah, I have, I have basically two kind of websites, if you will. Um, MacLackey.com, M-A-C-L-A-C-K-E-Y, MacLackey.com, which is just kind of a personal site, talks about what I'm up to in my life. And then Exit DNA, which is my business where I mentor entrepreneurs. Um, ExitDNA.com and then on social media, kind of at Mac Lackey, most, most places. But um, yeah, love to help anyone I can in, in your network. That's kind of the phase of life I, I'm in is I just want to help people. And I know there are a few areas, not many, but I can actually help people uh, create some good outcomes. So excellent. That's fantastic. No, honestly, thank you for, for all of that. Uh, let me any final thoughts from you, sir. No, it's fantastic. And I think uh, it got buttoned up beautifully. And I, I not only enjoy your, your uh, intellect, but your heart. So thank you for sharing both. Thank you very much. I appreciate the, the time. Agreed. Yes. And listener, thank you for sticking with us to another uh, to the end of another episode of the Frustrated CEO Podcast. Please connect with, I'd say in this case, connect with all three of us. And don't forget Patsy, even though she wasn't here today. Connect with all four of us on LinkedIn. That's where you'll find us all hanging out. Um, and please like, share, and follow, subscribe to the, to the program. If you know someone who is in that phase of, of you know, thinking about selling their business or someone who hasn't started thinking about it but should, uh, definitely check out ExitDNA.com, but also share this episode with them. That would be a, a, a great help to them and a great help to us. Uh, and I think that's it. We'll see you again next time on the Frustrated CEO Podcast. Music